Well, since we're all close personal friends now, <laughs> going to start talking plainer, more specific, to the point. <coughs> I'm in fact going to use, after looking over not just tonight's, but the questions from the last several weeks, because I can take them and run right from that to anything I was going to say anyway. But uh, in fact, now that they have ripened and that some of you are still here, if you would like to believe in unbelievable magic, is the questions are better. They're not as bad as they were two weeks ago. The same question. You have to find magic mystery where you can. Uh, now I'd like to say that anyone who is interested in this, I am delighted to have you here. It is exciting. I know that some of you I can see and that some of you are extremely excited and wish it would go faster or that I was meeting every time. Also, a few little things, since I promised I wouldn't engage in gossip of any sort or answer personal questions. A little of it is almost useful, but I'm not doing it for the purpose of it being personal, but uh, without asking the older group, when I say older group, the people that had been running the programs and whatnot that you had seen already, periodically, I've had to, wherever I was doing it, if I was going to continue with meeting with a group of people, put them up to bring in some new people. There is nothing all that mystical about it. If you have a group of anybody, bird watchers, the Atlanta Blue Jay Society, if they do not get fresh members, sooner or later, all organizations, all groups of people will consume themselves. Now, at the ordinary level, it makes scant difference because you can find the uh, Atlanta Literary Guild or the Atlanta, like I said, Bird Watcher Society. And it can very likely end up, they, they may advertise uh, somewhere in their business card in, since 1929. And you find they're holding a meeting over at the library <coughs> annex or an unused room at a filling station and you go there and you find there's three people. And that they've just reached that point and it's just these three people, they have nothing else to do and normally by that time, the three people are either widowed or widowers. <laughs> and they just around have a little coffee and. Perhaps the subject of birds may come up <laughs> if somebody new comes in. But this is literally, it is simply the nature of life. Any organization does not have to be religious or mystical. If you try to keep the organization itself, the group of people alive, it will, the same as any living organism, it will begin to consume itself if it does not get food. In the same way that if you go on a fast, the whole point is that you'll begin to eat your own body fat. And a group of any sort, not just mystical, I repeat, but they will begin to consume themselves. And therefore, it reaches a certain point, and uh, it's almost as though I have to provide all the energy, all the food, and then it's either stop and move on, or as I did, I turned them over, gave them the possibility, the choice of rounding up new people. But also, I want you to know that the older group, as I was calling it, the people already here, are also excited. Several people have already pointed out to me that if I started meeting with you more times a week, they just said it sort of as a rhetorical what if, but they said if it came to the point, because right now I mean with them three times a week and we're doing these tapes for the, all these shows all over the world, these cable things, but several people of the older group said if there was a choice after just being here twice of meeting with you people or the old group that they'd pick being here with you in case you'd like to figure that out. <laughs> uh, and I also know, uh, I was looking back over the question. I am not going to ever get into anything personal, but I do understand that if you if you find yourself believing that you belong here, then I, until further notice, you're quite welcome. I'm delighted if you're interested in it. You're the only people in the world that interest me. That's just the way it is. If you're not, you're not, and I'm, nobody's going to talk you into it because they can't. And I I'm not going to refer to a lot of history as to how this happened because I already told you the truth. Now, I may read a couple of questions from the first night here just to remind you of what you ask. But uh, there is no secret message. Let me repeat one more time. There is nothing I do not represent anybody. There is no teacher. There is no group. There is no other shoe. There is no secret message. Uh, let me repeat one more time so that you do have, if I may have been sort of unwieldy the first time you heard it last week, but I'll repeat it one more time to give you some idea of the span between someone doing this and then someone who's interested in it. That is, between you and me. 
it's on this kind of basis. You've got to find the far extreme. And I said, now it's in between. It's neither one of these, but I, I found some favor with it. And I'll give you one more shot. That in a sense, I was so excited, let's say, when I was 20 years old, that I would have down there cut off a vital part. Last time I told you my foot, <laughs> I didn't want to think about I did not want to consider anything worse than that. <laughs> I would have died. I would have been so excited to have found a me. And yet, now let me give you the other extreme to cover it down. Uh, now I've had a long time to know me, and I am not impressed whatsoever. <laughs> it's not fake humility. I've got nothing bad to say about me, because I know me better than you ever will if that was important, and I am simply not impressed by me. It's not something that you can fake or hide, so by now you should have some notion anyway. But understand, this is not a comment on me. This is a comment on the kind of relationship, so that if you think that in some way you're here doing me a favor because people did ask questions, the kind of things I said I could have written for you in advance the first night. Several people, the question got down to this, is, well, exactly, why do you want me here? You know, what's in it for you? Somebody always asks that, and it's not absolutely untoward. But how is that the first question? Ask yourself in the same way, other than the fact if you did believe, well, wait a minute. It's going to be some kind of mad cult situation, and they're going to drug me and <laughs> kidnap me and hold me here. As you can see, it's far from that. It's insofar as what I want out of you. It is simply that I'm telling you that the most direct answer for the time being, and I don't mean there's anything hidden, but the most direct answer is that the group here in Atlanta got you. If they hadn't, I was probably going to close up and go somewhere else again. They brought you here, and that's a matter of, you know, do you belong here? Do you feel like that you're getting what you thought you were looking for, or perhaps you didn't even know what you were looking for, and you thought, well, hey, this ain't bad. In either case, just remember, it's not a contest. It is not a uh, competition of any sort between you and me, and it's not a love feast. Uh, nobody has my photograph at their house. No one chants my name before they go to bed. Uh, and yet, I, one other thing, and yet I know this, after making that sort of fun of the matter, uh, I am well aware it's part of the human condition that, uh, assuming that you like this thus far, you've got somewhere in you, after all I've done now, you would be loath to admit it, but somewhere in you, you want to see some sort of hero or imagine God, what's his background? Where all has he been? What wondrous things has he seen? Miraculous people he's met? Me. <laughs> and I've already told you, now that I know it, I'm not that impressed. But you've got to remember the other extreme. I would have died to meet somebody like me. Sooner or later, if things go correctly, I was going to point out, this will be or should be your individual position towards yourself. That the day will come. Let's say sometime in the future and you'll realize suddenly that you are not impressed, maybe the subject will come up, something about egotism or whatever it is, and you'll suddenly realize, or maybe somebody will even turn on you and go, you know, I've been watching your progress over the last few years of talking to you, and you're the damnedest person. I never told you this until having a few beers, <laughs> but by God, you know, whatever your name is, I am talking to you. You're just very impressive. And of course, by then you can understand, if not already, a little alcohol in the blood or that kind of faux friendship, and you think, yeah, I know what you mean, but you think, well, you just don't know me because there's nothing to be impressed about, and yet, you should be able to remember what I'm telling you tonight in the same way you think, yeah, but X number of years ago, so we're putting you in the future, you'd think, if I could, if I knew then what I know now, and I could be both people, I would have cut off my foot to meet me, now I know what he meant. And yet thinking that didn't make you turn back around the person and say, wait a minute, I withdraw my, my humble response. You're right. I am great. <laughs> no? Then you are in the middle of the position I'm describing now between our sort of relationship. Is it becomes the same way about you. If this is what you're after, nothing else will do. And, uh, and one other thing, secret messages. I get people write me and people stop me in places that have seen the TV show. And I know that some of you will do it, because part of what I was going to point out tonight is the absolutely arbitrary, inescapable 
binary appearance or your binary conception of what life is operating at the ordinary level of consciousness, wherein it's always a matter of either an attack or an excuse that criticism is the order of the day for the human mind. It's simply having to do with the way I'm going to describe the brain itself and awareness. But on that basis, many of the examples and things that I can say will sound at times, and I keep for the first few nights, uh, making a reminder and a caveat that is not criticism, and even though I, sometimes you will laugh and it sounds as though it's a some cynical remark, is not. And yet the mind hears it that way, because at the ordinary level of perceiving life to be this three-dimensional realm, and you're being run by two-dimensional energy, literally, you've got no choice. It's either this or that. And so I, for a while, say, now listen, if I use an example and I pull out religion or politics or economics, I'm not picking on that field. And I, you go, okay. And I'll start, and let's assume that in some way you got in for bankers, they just repossessed your car, and I'll pull out the world of economics. And if you could watch yourself in a certain way internally, you'll have your own little binary zork, little guy in your brain go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, sock it to the bankers. And I'm not socking it to the bankers. And there is no secret message. Well, I was going to say, I have people come up. It's an old story. I don't mean it's just me. But I say, I watch you on TV. I read one of your books. And uh, I understand what it is. You just can't come out and say what you're talking about, actually. <laughs> because, you know, they, they believe it's the kind of people, basically, they're the conspiratorial theorists. theorists. They're driven. They think, yeah, I know you're talking about the international banking conspiracy, the communist conspiracy driven underground, or such and such. And they'll try to give me a wink, staying over by the fresh foods and say, yeah, I watch you all the time and keep it up because I know what, I know that you can't actually say. I say exactly what I mean. There is no hidden conspiracy. There is no message behind it. But I say that to remind you because you'll find yourself if you watch. Uh, to the ordinary mind, everything sounds to have, to some degree, if, when you start talking about life, it sounds to some degree that you're being critical, at least ironic, which is just the basis of criticism, because when you're dealing with a two-dimensional two energy, two-dimensional sense of consciousness, and you've got a conception of a 3D world, irony is inevitable. And irony is just sort of pseudo-sophisticated talk for smartass. But ironic, I know, throughout history, all the way from the Greeks and the West, of them trying to point out, and people still do, how ironic. How ironic that a religion will preach, for instance, here we go, will preach peace and brotherhood, and then kill those who oppose it. Ha! Huh, how ironic. It's not ironic, it's inevitable. Because irony is simply an unexpected result of what seemed to be the setup. It's an unexpected punchline to the joke. You think, well, all right, the joke was set up that, hello, we're the Catholic Church, or we're the Jews, or we're the Muslims, and we're here to help you and be your friend. By the way, anyone who does not show up for service tonight will have will be shot. You go, how ironic. Not ironic. It's a result of limited consciousness. Well, I'm going to jump into some of the, or get to them, some of the questions. And those of you who wrote them, in case your memory is good at all, I may change a word or two here or there. And you won't owe me. <laughs> I'm glad to do it. I may change, <laughs> just a few, I may change a word. I may add or subtract a word from your question because I know now that that's what you meant. <laughs> there is, uh, I assume some of you, but I have seen the things, that, the tapings I do, and every night it's been a habit for a while that I write what appears, amounts to like one-liners, stories. I sometimes refer them to a news item, and I write, bring 10 or 15 minutes worth every night that we do the tapings for the stations around the country. And there's stories I've already quoted, referred to one in my creation story, but anytime you hear me referring, quoting myself, that's where that sort of thing came from. And there was one that would be applicable to you people that simply said, it's a good start for tonight, that life starts out simple. But as soon as men begin to think, it seems to become very, very complicated. And to stay ordinary and normal 
Men can never get over that notion. That is a literal description. That is the literal description of the progress of man from a less than conscious being into what passes now for being an intellectual, mentally conscious creature. That once you begin to think, things are not simple. Whereas, again, although it's not perfect, it's as good as any to compare man to the other creatures on this planet. Life is simple to any creature without an intellect. It's do or die, eat or be et. That's it. You either survive the day or you do not. There is nothing complex about that, nothing complicated whatsoever. But once you begin to think, life becomes very complicated, and there is nowhere to blame it on. I could start, in case you don't put it together, I could start taking the kind of sociological or psychological uh, analysis, ordinary analysis of man, and point out that, well, yes, yeah, as soon as you, your intellect becomes active enough that you begin to speak, and your parents, whoever's acting as your parents, begin, they take you, they begin to hold you responsible for what you do. They begin to give you new rules and regulations. But up until then, you can use the bathroom when and wherever you please. You can throw food. You can spit up. You can do anything you want to. But uh, even though child psychology doesn't look at it this way, the day you say your first coherent word that your mother goes, I heard that. He said, Mama, I could hear it. You're done for. <laughs> now, she may, they may not start that day, and it's not their fault, so I'm telling you. It's the way life is arranged. But after that, life, in the guise of your parents, began to hold you responsible gradually, and it increases very rapidly. And it's simply based upon speech, and people don't know what they're looking at, but it's simply that the intellect is now getting fired up, and you're no longer simply a little ha hairless child chimpanzee. You're now, I hate to say it, but you've now become human. You have begun to think, more or less. And after that, things do become complicated, very complicated. Whereas up to that point, there is a certain unfairness, as I said, because the comparison is not perfect. But if you consider back, even before you could recall, since you had no intellect, you can't recall, regardless of people that, or they call it kinds of regression, and they remember being in the womb. <laughs> of course, uh, that's not sarcasm, because those same people, I can say, well, what were you thinking two seconds ago before mm -hmm. I said that? They can remember what happened before they were born, but they can't remember where they parked the car. <laughs> now, we'll get that in a minute. We're not picking on anybody specific. That's the nature, because people do not remember. You can imagine anything you want to. That's what passes for freedom of consciousness with ordinary people. As you tell them, well, you can't think anything you want to. And they go, suddenly they'll pull something like that. Well, don't tell me that. I could do it for years and years. Well, yeah, how long? Well, even when I was in my mother's womb, and you think, well, there goes that. You didn't follow? <laughs> All you got to do is think of something absolutely insane and impossible, and that's proof to an ordinary man, hey, I am intellectually free. I could, in fact, if I wanted to push it, I could be absolutely, I could be certifiable crazy. <laughs> if you got it, you got it. Once you begin to think, life becomes very, seems to become very, very complicated. And that is a part and parcel of the network of how life grows in man and how life grows on this planet. And to stay normal, ordinary, and I could go ahead and say sane, but to stay just normal, you cannot get over that notion. From another view, that is a fine, the with all of that, the other hand of that, is a splendid description. That is to reverse when I say that to stay normal, you must never get over that notion that life is very complicated. Then I could take all the historical descriptions of the liberation of the mind, the uh, rebirth of man, the discovery of the kingdom of God, the enlightenment, the awakening of consciousness, and take that sort of description, and it is the absolute reverse of that. That is that you no longer, that you have gotten over the notion. It's not a re retrenching, and it's not a re retreat back to some time because you can't go back. But it is that you have gotten over that notion that life is very, very complicated. I assure you, 
among many things that you might see if you discover the secret of life, one of them will not be the very, very complicated nature of life. <laughs> Whatever you see now as being the very, very complicated nature of life, you're at the zenith. You're there. You're never going to see it more complicated, <laughs> which is what I was suggesting that Buddha and Abraham and everybody, when they see it, they go, damn. <laughs> well, I know I'm putting mud. Ooh. Ah. But it's not. If it was more complicated, may I suggest to you, they would not simply go, ah. Ah. No, you'd have to get out pad and pencil and think, oh boy, now it's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was going to give you another, I'm just going to go back and forth because some of the questions, I'm going to pull them in. But what we were talking about last time, this can almost sound like metaphor. And there was somebody asking a question in there about metaphor. It's metaphor and it's not. And it was the description I was giving you, more specifically, of the human nervous system. But let's take it straight right up into the head, which is where it's of significance. It is not to discount the body of man. It's not to discount everything from a level of consciousness down, but you have got to very quickly understand the body, anything from a level of consciousness down, is not going to cause you to expand your consciousness. But it can keep you where you are. It'd be like putting it another way. There's nothing you can do, really, to lengthen your life. But there's things you can do to shorten it, <laughs> literally. But you can work out forever. You can do everything you want to. And uh, well, most of you people, I assume by now, you're not going to get the blues really. Either. You can get as healthy as you want to. You can do anything you want to. And you're still going to die on schedule. But there are things you can do to speed it up. I mean, if you're in a hurry. <laughs> but the, do you follow that, uh, well, the body, you cannot discount it, but there is nothing, there is, it is not the efficient way. It's not even worth, worthy of a alert person's attention. Once it's pointed out to you, you should hear it. There is nothing you can do. There is no physical discipline. There is no ritual. And there is nothing wrong with it, but of sitting, of dancing, of uh, doing postures, there is nothing physically that will, of itself, there's nothing in the body that will expand consciousness. But there are things you can do to your body, such as drugs and booze, that at the time, if you've got some idea that I'm getting more conscious while I'm stoned, I bet you could probably remember things that happened in your mother's womb. <laughs> in other words, it is not working. There are things that you can do physically that will keep you where you are. But there is nothing physically you can do that directly will lead to some state of greater awareness or enlightenment. So we're going, let me just go up to the head. And you remember my line, the level of consciousness, and last time I even drew. And do not get tied up. I know it's very popular, left brain, right brain, uh, theory and the whole kinds of pictures. That's not what I'm talking about. They caught up with me. They, well, I just can't forever. It's not worthwhile for me to keep changing all the terminology I do it anyway. I'm not talking about that. It just so happens that the human brain is cut up that way and it fits. What I'm going to describe to you. I don't mean it's not true when I'm telling you, but it's metaphor and it's more than metaphor. It actually happens, but I just want to disavow you that this has any connection with any kind of theory of anybody's or any idea, even neurological studies going on. It's not that. It's something else. Let's also assume, I guess you can see it, the human eyes. And you recall the one I was drawing for you last week, the overall. <laughs> and I was doing that this is the energy that keeps you alive, and it goes there, and it skips across to the other side. And if you complete it, you're alive. When you start becoming less, or re reach the point that you cannot act as a conductor to the energy, and it's coming out of the planet. It's not the origin, but it's coming out of the planet, and that's what being alive is, just to refresh your memory. But now specifically, this amounts to the level of consciousness of everybody. It is a common collective level of 
consciousness, I pointed out last time, and I know that people seem to vary greatly. But remember, we're talking about normal, healthy people, not people of any sort of physical, genetic, neurological damage, just ordinary people. The range that you would normally think between people's level of consciousness is not even worthy of discussion. Until you see it, I am not misleading you. I won't say trust me, but until you see it, I am not misleading you. It is simply not. Once you see it, it's of no consequence. It's not criticism. It is as though if that's the planet, there's a level of consciousness. Let's assume that's, remember all these little people staying all over the world? Like that? Just ordinary people. There is a common level of consciousness running right through there that that is the intelligence of humanity. That is the consciousness of humanity. It is a literal fact. It's of no great importance to ordinary people. I might get some ordinary person could hear that or listen to it from me and go, oh, that's a nice theory or obviously as an allegory if you know what you're doing for something. That's a fact. It is like a cloud. And at that level, you are tied into it. It is collective consciousness. And I don't refer to uh, Carl Jung and the idea of some kind of collective unconscious. So remember, mm -hmm. if I say some of the terms or say some terms you've heard before, uh, if I meant somebody else, if I was referring to somebody, I'd tell you, and I'm not. It is not that thing of a collective unconscious of humanity. Now, since some of you probably did not sleep through Psych 101 in college and heard the term. This is a collective consciousness. It is the common consciousness of humanity. And if that is the level at which you let the energy bridge, this gap between both sides of your brain, then that is the level at which you are conscious. And that's it. You can stay on your head. You can get two or three doctoral degrees. You can do anything you want to. But you will only see what everyone else sees. You will only be conscious of that level. That has nothing to do with this sort of activity. This is, as I told you, individualistic. It's got nothing to do with the collective awareness of humanity. Because that, the collective wisdom, as they might want to call it, of humanity, you already have. I hate to tell you again, but like I said, you're supposed to be big boys and girls. I know it comes as a shock, two things in a row, that you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and now to tell you, but then again, if you get good at this, it's always good news to realize that as conscious as you are now, or as you might have wanted to put it before now, as intelligent, as perceptive as you are now, that's it. There's nowhere else to go in that way. You are as conscious, again, assuming that all of you are fairly ordinary and not drug damaged or brain damaged. Sitting around at your best, after a good night of conversation with whoever you like, some friend and plenty of coffee and all inspired by something, and yet you know when you leave that night that I keep feeling like I'm close to seeing what's going on. I don't. That's it. You'll never get any higher than that. You understand as much as anybody on this planet does, and you cannot rid yourself of that at the collective level. Here's what happens. One more time. It's allegory and metaphor, and it's more. As long as you're letting it operate this way, we got questions in here about staring and holding attention, and we'll tie them together because that's what you're asking about, whether you knew it or not. The energy, remember this same diagram, and here it comes up, and it comes there, and if you let your attention, no matter who you are, no matter what sex, what race, how old you are, if you let what you normally think of, if you let your normal state of consciousness continue, then this is bridged, let me just call it, it's, it's bridging the gap between the two areas of the brain that keeps you conscious. As I said, all you got to do is be damaged. And even medicine knows this. You become unconscious. You may live another 50 or 60 years in a vegetated state, comatose state, but you will still survive from the brain stem down. You can do it. At this level, if it just jumps right there, it's what you normally think of as your level of consciousness, what you think of as your personality. It's what answers to I. It is what you think that you're thinking with, and you're not. The common collective consciousness of man is thinking. The truth is, life is thinking. And you cannot escape from it. 
when you think at that level, when you're conscious at that level, all of your interests are common, gross, mundane, routine, and locked, that you will never be any more conscious than you are, and it's not anybody's fault. That is the collective consciousness of the herd. That is the collective consciousness of man and the consciousness of the so-called mystics. There's something else entirely different. It is individualistic, and there's only, or there are all sorts of ways I can tell you to go about trying to do it, but there is only one end result to all the attempts and all the methods, and that is where this jumps, where you are continually, many, many, many times per second, when the electrical current is doing that, is you can grab it and you can hold it, and it serves no collective purpose. It will help not one whit your fellow man. It will not turn you into Saint Mother Teresa or Albert Schweitzer. It, for all intents and purposes, for people who will end up asking, it does no real great, or serves no real great immediate benefit to the collective of humanity. You can look at sort of the negative way that I was telling you about the body and living longer. We could say that the more conscious you are, the less likely you are to do damage to anybody. But I mean, one mer person, how much damage can you do anyway? <laughs> I mean, you can go out and be a mass killer, but nowadays, by the time you can get off, jump in a Kmart or a post office, seems to be the new shooting ground, by the time you can get off six or eight rounds, somebody's going to come up and shoot you, so you know, life can handle it. <laughs> so being more conscious is not a point that you are suddenly going to make those around you begin to swoon and to worship you, and to, to suddenly, some way, you'll bring peace and prosperity on the planet by becoming more conscious. Now, everything at one time. I'm going to start some of the questions. I didn't consider this, not knowing where to start, which one to start with. Okay. Are there explicit steps toward neuralizing prime Neuralization primary to not listening to yourself and giving attention to the present. And there was another very similar one. Well, somebody asked, I thought I had it, Ask about how do you, the question amounted to how do you uh, hold your attention in the midst of everyday life, or how do you keep, once you had some idea that this, let's assume that this now had some discernible, apparent goal to you, if we called it this kind of stuff. That's all right, this kind of stuff, and I'm all, what we've been talking about and meaning about. And the question amounted to how, when you're trying to apply yourself to ordinary, everyday affairs, how do you keep this in mind? How do you remember this? How do you keep not from getting distracted? Okay, here. How to remember about this whole da da da. My version of it covered it. How do you remember such as this? How can you keep this kind of aim in mind, whatever you think it is by now, but how do you do this and still you're out in life having to put up with everyday affairs is the basis of it, I'll assume. The blunt answer is that you should not be engaging in anything that keeps you in your normal day's condition. And that's the easy one. Now can we change it? It's not all that easy. And by... When I said that's the easy one, you'd understand I was using a bit of dramatic sarcasm by saying, well, that's very difficult because then you would think, well, we we're faced with like Buddha's seven or 12 step self-help program. All the ideas from religions about do not do that, which would interfere with your spiritual growth has been the old story. But uh, what are you going to do in life that is compatible with? What are you going to do in life that is conducive to doing something extraordinary? And once you begin to see it, there is nothing, and it's not an attack on life. It's just two different fields. The thing to do, and several other people 
maybe I won't have to look them all up, ask about staring that they heard from a tape or from uh, the old group talking to you people somewhere about staring. And what did I mean and what was the point of it? Staring is an absolute manifestation and you can do it, it's very easy to see on people externally, in case you're like thinking about it, you can even see a still photograph of somebody. <laughs> and you know when they're staring. And it makes no sense. And I'm not sure that any physiologist, I'm not sure anybody could describe why. Well, you think about it. You can see a head-on shot of somebody, anybody, just a person, and they'd be staring right at the camera, let's say, and it's one thing. But if they take a shot of a person, they're going. <laughs> you can even see it in the photograph. You realize that they're somewhat taken away in their thinking. As the French used to call it, an ide fixe. They are in a daze. Uh, it's not all that bad because you stay in a daze. It just happens so fast that you pay it generally no notice. But people constantly. I can make some comment right now and seem to stop for a second or something that struck you. And if you'd watch it, you'll go. And I think out in the ordinary world, it's oft times passed off as reflection, <laughs> ruminating, <laughs> chewing the cud, co even concentration when a man gets desperate. <laughs> And you find him, you say, uh, are you listening to me? And you're talking to somebody, and they go, oh, yeah, I was, well, I was just concentrating on what you said, which is always the last ditch stand. But notice that apparently, it apparently is the avant-garde of some intellectual explanation of why you were sort of dozing off to sleep. You know, and I got in a daze, is you go, and somebody says, are you listening to me? I'm trying to tell you something. You go, oh, yeah, well, I was just concentrating on what you just said. And they go, well, all right. And everybody knows in a way that's a lie. You just almost took a nap. You almost fell asleep, but there you stand, or there you sit in an important board meeting, or in some situation wherein you're not going to actually lay down and tuck yourself in bed. <laughs> but there it is, your mind goes, and you stare. Right? It's not just that staring. If you get fairly proficient at it, it's no big deal. You're staring constantly. The whole thing of this automatic bridging from one side of the brain to the other, of completing the common circuit that establishes the collective consciousness of humanity, it is a constant. One reason that you do not feel it, one reason you're not aware of this going on, is like it is a constant, little discreet versions of staring. But it goes so fast, the best analogy is, of course, I say of course, of course, a movie film going by and it seems to produce motion wherein all you got to do is look at the film and you know it's nothing but a series of still shots. And men are continually, at the ordinary level of awareness, you're continually staring from here to there. Sometimes it's reflected. If it gets exaggerated, if you hold it over a few seconds, it's when people say, wake up. You go, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I was thinking about something else. You got any excuse you want to. There's nothing out of the ordinary. It was just a, an unusually prolonged series that you just like fell on one frame there and you went, It takes that kind of condition to normally operate in life. And the question about how to keep in mind some extraordinary aim and operate and pursue ordinary activities in life, how do you do both? On the basis of that question, if an ordinary person asks that question, so whoever asks the question, I'm speaking generically, so don't take it as some personal response to you. But the real question to an ordinary, the real response to an ordinary person were, were to ask that, you'd say, well, you can't. Because at the ordinary level of consciousness, you cannot. Because at the ordinary of consciousness, you've got no control over uh, your awareness anyway. And so to say, well, how could I hold something in mind of an unusual nature, trying to, let's just call it, trying to be more conscious, how can I do that and yet go out and do my job, drive the car, talk to ordinary people? At that level, you can't. As long as you are simply conscious at that level, at the common collective level of humanity, nothing's possible. And that's some more bad news, but then again, it's some more good news. Because once you understand that, at least you quit wasting your damn time. <laughs> because there's nothing you can do at that level. You are not going to change it. It is the staring level. Or if you want another parallel, another allegory of it, 
is it is like your awareness is just focused on something. And it's like a spotlight, and you just turn it here and there, and it's not always external, of course. It's internal. You're staring constantly. The external part is of no great consequence. I mean, the number of times that you can see somebody stare is what I mean, because it's internally where it is, is you can look at ordinary consciousness. When it is being activated in you at that sort of level, that it's just automatic and you have no awareness of it and no control over it, it is as though consciousness is literally like a spotlight internally. And you look from one thing to another, and that passes. And it works with ordinary people as being their consciousness, their intelligence. And they can be geniuses. They can make reputations in many fields, intellectual endeavors, artistic areas. They can make fortunes. And they've never done anything other than stare here and there. One way I was going to say just to carry that same picturization a bit further is you attempt not to stare internally. And you can start off doing it actually physically, which many people find to be of some interest to start with the first few times you try it or you try it a few days and try never to let your eyes stop, which I guess, well, you'll find out for yourself. Some people it wears them out, but some people even though they think they're interested in this, that's why I was holding it down to an hour instead of four or five. Mm -hmm. Some people it's like that you'll show up here, and I understand it, I've been through it enough, that think, boy, I can't wait for the next meeting, then you get here and it's almost as though you feel like, well, I'm having to absorb constant body blows. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not even looking at you. And you just feel like, Jesus, I can't stand much more, and you don't know why, and it's like you're about to drift off or you want to shift around. Think about it. Of course, the easiest thing is to blame me. Like, well, he, he's boring. <laughs> But then, you're th but then you're left with this, well, why did you come back? And so it's got to be something else. And what it is, is the whole thing is going against the whole weight, the whole movement, the whole momentum of life itself at the conscious level. And this is just an attempt. You're standing up in the middle of the world's largest, largest river. That is, it's the size of the universe. It's the parade of humanity going boom. And it's like, I'm trying to make you stand up. Like, let's stop just for a minute. <laughs> and you stop, and it's like, literally, we're speaking neurologically now, intellectually. It's like you're standing up and the whole weight, not either good or bad, but the whole weight, the whole force of the intellectual river right now of life is against you. No matter where you stand, you understand, it's not that they're wrong and you're going to stand and stop it. That's not what we're saying. It's simply that you're trying to stand up. You're trying to rise above that sort of diagram that at that level you look out. If your consciousness is no more than that of the collective of humanity, you'll only see what they see. You'll never see what you're up to. You'll never see what it is you want to see. And then you've got all the kinds of allegories and myths, if you recall them. The whole idea originally of heaven and the gods living somewhere else. The whole idea of raising one's consciousness. Or the whole, to take it to a more mundane allegory, the whole idea some sort of warfare, some sort of battle going on, or some sort of excursion, and you're down on the plains trying to, you're looking for the enemy, or you're looking for the fountain of youth, or you're looking for anything, a McDonald's, and you look out and it's just all flat and you can't see, and up here on the ridge you send out a scout, some ass is up there and he hollers, hey, it's just about two miles away, and you can look all you want to, but if he's up 2,000 feet, and he says, really, I see it, or he can send you a warning, I see, hey, there's a hurricane coming, Everybody, they stand on their tiptoes and they don't see anything. They go, he's crazy. I didn't mean to, I shouldn't bring in negative ones. He hollers, right over there. Place to eat. Good food, just keep going over that way. And you look and you don't see anything. It is simply a different perspective. If you have got to, it's like going into another dimension to see beyond the binary, dualistic level. But that's all you can see there. It is synonymous with staring because that kind of thing you have to select when I say you have to you're wired up to I don't mean that you decide to but your consciousness is continuing fixing here there and it goes so fast that it's normally taken as being a state of consciousness the process of consciousness the process of thought and that's really a misnomer once you see it it is not a process it is a series of discrete moments of staring that is, in fact, whether you majored in that or even took logic, that's what logic amounts to. It's what mathematics amounts to. It's what linear reality amounts to, that you have to select something over the other. It is a state of staring. And rather than 
that sort of state producing what I described as being a spotlight, that you just have to turn on something. One way to look at it, to start with, a prelude to it is, would be like a searchlight, a lighthouse, a continual scanning that you do not look at anything in specifically. You see it, but you don't stop and go. Oh. Now, ordinary mind would say, well, you've got to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they could describe, I can do it for them. About, well, if you're going to think about something, you're going to think about, oh, do I agree with the president's policy on foreign affairs? Do I agree upon the Senate's version of a new tax bill? Well, I have to stop and think, well, let me think. I know, yeah, 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 except for this. If a man had any sort of non-segmented memory, then I could say, uh, by the way, I mean, you're saying you had to think about this like it's a new thing. Well, yeah. No, words, you, you've never looked at that before. Well, not exactly. And that's all you need to know. Because the truth is, you have. At the ordinary level, anything that, you, that your mind would want to tell you that, wait a minute, don't listen to that kind of stuff. Sometimes you have to stop and go, hmm, and think about something. I'll give you that, except for this. Now, you've got to be fair and rational, ex expeditious with your time and energy. Then the question is, all right, have you ever thought about this before? Now, you're just going back over the same ground, and it takes quite an expansive awareness to be able to unconditionally suddenly realize it's like a small awakening. Well, hell yeah. All you have been doing is watching reruns all your life. All you're <laughs> doing is rereading the same book over and over. That's one reason that would-be mystics find life somewhat grating. <laughs> Especially that, well... Now, you got to remember, this is not criticism. I hadn't warned you in 30 minutes. But especially the areas known as entertainment. Well, even worse, areas known as information. You know, yeah, except once you can hear, you realize you haven't heard anything new. If you had that kind of good, non-discreet, that is, non-chopped-up memory, you haven't really heard anything new. You haven't seen anything new. I'll be lenient. Since the age of seven, <laughs> some of you are probably sharp enough, age of five. <laughs> but notice, as long as you will stare, and as long as you forget that you just stared over there, you can tell somebody. You can say, do you realize you keep talking about the same thing over and over? Or you get good, you tell your brain, you tell your mind, do you realize you keep thinking the same thing over and over? And it says, no, I don't. <laughs> and you go, well, last time I accused you of it, you said that you didn't. You go, no, I didn't. And suddenly it's like you're doing Monty Python in your own head, just you. <laughs> One side's minor and one side's Python. You keep going back and forth. And for those of you who like the idea of consciousness and children's TV, it's the Bert and Ernie show. <laughs> Except you got to remember that it was Jim Henson's hand up everybody's knickers. There's one hand driving everything, which is the human nervous system. It is life. And you go, wait a minute. I'm not sure I agree with that. I'm sure you don't. And some over here says, yeah, but I do. Well, I, I knew you would. I knew that. Uh, people want to know other questions, making the tremendous progress that we are tonight. I know that people wanted to know things to do, and I was going to tell you some specifically about this, but also a few other things people wanted to know specifically, questions about this and that. Let me tell you, when I said that there's no nothing specifically you can do uh, that's going to produce any uh, increased state of consciousness, there's nothing you can physically do but there are things that you can do that will interfere <coughs> easily to point out is uh, some sort of constant use of drugs and alcohol. That doesn't mean that you know, getting stoned or having beers and something to drink every now and then is the end of the world. But to constantly keep that in your system, forget anything else. That's the easy one. The real one, though, is aggression, hostility. That is the one, uh, once you understand it, and there's not even that complicated because it, all it is is a holdover from the lower area of the nervous system. It is simply the non-intellectual, the animal aspect of man brought into the intellect and other than the collective. To an individual man, ask yourself, what possible basis is there for intellectual aggression? Now, I know you may not be the think that you can actually answer it right then, but surely some of you get the gist of why I'm pointing out. At the ordinary level, it's important. 
It is the basis, uh, collectively, of social position. It's the basis of holding governments together. It is tied to everything. It is the basis of uh, egotism, self-image. People can say, well, I've worked my way up in life. I've done this and that and this and that. All they're doing is playing that they won't be the big dog in a pack. That's all it is. It is still, as always, the intellect, man's consciousness, is absolutely dependent. Your consciousness is more dependent, if you want to look at it. I saw a few blank faces last Tuesday when I pointed this out. But your stomach, you got no consciousness about your stomach, about your spleen. You can start thinking about all sorts of mystical things or the spark of the divine in you and this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your consciousness is more directed to your stomach than anything you ever heard of. So we're back to this, that you cannot separate upstairs. I don't know how many tapes you heard, but I have of late, a lot of times I will use as an allegory the ideas of apartment houses and condos and buildings about people living upstairs and downstairs. And to give you some hint now, I'm not in the real estate business. It is actually an allegory. <laughs> and I, I suspect that what I have in mind is something to do with the development of the human nervous system individually and collectively speaking. But, co but collectively speaking, what seems to be men's personalities, their ego, and now in the sense I do not mean it in a pejorative way, the ego, which you've got to have to operate in life, out in ordinary life. You have got to fight for some sort of position. You simply do, at the ordinary level. But an individual, anyone who has any potential to understand what life's about, has any potential to actually benefiting from this, you've got to see pretty shortly, that's why I present you with a rhetorical question, whether you can feel as though you verbally answered, what possible, when you look at it as, in as cold-blooded a clinical way as possible, what is the possible use of intellectual aggression, if there was strictly such a thing? And you cannot come up with any reasonable reason, except with ordinary people, there is an intellectual conflict going on, a battle. How else are you going to make a reputation? How else are you going to get published? And uh, whatever you're saying, archaeology, whatever the, your field is, if you've got some new idea that, yes, I have finally discovered that Troy, the city of Troy did exist re regardless of what my so-and-so and another guy, he sends in one saying, no, there is an intellectual battle going on. There's an intellectual battle apparently going on between religions, between cultures. I know, I know, I know. At that level. But now I'm back asking you, at an individual level, what? Just think about it. What possible use? If you understood anything, if you understand anything, just one little item, and somebody walks by, you walks up to you and say, I hear that you are an expert in such and such. You go, well, and they go, uh, and I plus I heard you one time, somebody said that you said blah, 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 and it's something, this one thing maybe you do know. You go, yeah, I said that. And they go, you could not be more incorrect. You're an idiot. You're a fool. Now, assuming they didn't drag it down too much to the hormone, to the animal level, to the point that you wanted to actually, or felt as though maybe they're going to physically attack you and you kick them first. If it just stayed at that level, what if you were Einstein and a kid walks up to you and says, my daddy says you're an idiot. And a little kid, am I, are we getting somewhere without me having to, if you know anything, you've got to understand or you've got to suspect that something is wrong. If there's really something you know and somebody else comes up to you and says, I heard that you said so and so. And you went, yeah. And they go, you're an idiot. And you go, anything after that. You understand? If you respond, if you go, well, who the hell are you? The case is closed. I mean, as far as there being an argument, as far as there being a contest, and you think I'm fixing to tell you who was right, there it is. Is that still plain enough? And it has nothing to do with morality, but it is at the heart, if you notice of all religions, it's at the heart of all the civilizing, the attempted civilizing influences and institutions of man, is they keep trying to drag you further and further away from that kind of animal aggression, which you are not going to rid man of. But what they keep trying to do is rid him of it up here. But it's a very gradual process. And thus far, even you people that going by city histories, you've got a good three or 4,000 year history to see how far it's gone. You're, you're, a little, you're a little less dangerous to live next to than Nero was. Maybe I didn't pick a good example, but. Some of the more rough 
some of the more rough neighborhoods of Athens at the time, or Rome. You, know, you, you may be a little safer to live next door to, but you've got to understand, not a great deal. The murder rate in New York is you know, higher now, I think, than comparably speaking, taking it per capita than it was in the wildest days of Rome. Not that means anything, but you understand. The point is, the evolution of man, insofar as breeding out the aggression, hmm, it gets better and better and better, but it does not get better in one man's lifetime. A man begins to die, his hormones wear out, he gets less aggressive, he gets less sexually driven, is, on, is the only way that somebody that's 50 or 60 years old passes under any conditions as becoming wise. <laughs> the fuckers are just worn out. You're no longer horny, and you can play like, well, I got over, now that now I understand what life's about. I no longer go out, I used to run away with my wife, I used to try to cheat my fellow man to get ahead. But now I understand the futility. I understand that there should be a greater, the only thing is he's dying. He's just worn out. You got to be able to do that before you die. Is what some of the religions try to fool around with. You got to do that a long time before you die. Is you're escaping. You got to individually escape that kind of direct hole between that kind of animal aggression and up here. Because drugs and all, as I pointed out, will stop you. But here it is. I'm going to tell you before we, I guess it'll be next time before I actually get into the positives. But I'm going to tell you what will absolutely stop it. And that is any hostility, any aggression. And this has nothing to do with defending yourself because. I'll show you that, you know, Buddha, I was trying to think of, think about the most passive picture. If somebody come up and push Buddha, he would have pushed them back. Well, I mean, if they were serious. If somebody pulled a knife, he would have pulled a gun. <laughs> yeah. the, point is, the point is, defend yourself. I'm just saying, it's not a point of being passive. That's not it. Uh, it's neither here nor there. It's up here. To understand that aggression up here, I'm telling you, is the one thing. It is without a doubt. You can drink a little. You can smoke a little. You cannot do this a little. I mean, you're going to for a long time. I'm trying to send you out thinking, oh, woe is me. But up here, putting your hands on other people intellectually, all forms of criticism, and if you can see it in a way, all religions, all would-be mystical cults, that's right at the heart of it, except they don't know what to do with it. I mean, they're not supposed to. It's just a mass encouragement of humanity to be less aggressive. It's life pushing men collectively in that direction. But you cannot, if you're going to do this, it's not a gradual push. You've got to understand. You've got to begin to see you're continually criticizing. You're continually cutting life up. It is just a chatter of the mind. It's nothing. Nobody caused it. It's you're alive. You're collective. You're conscious at the collective common level. No higher, no lower. And it's nothing. There's no way out. You're not going anywhere beyond that. And the one thing that will keep you there, the one thing that staring is tied to, is a dualistic thought of it's me against them, it's me against out there. It is always a form of criticism. You're talking about somebody. And so I'll tell you right now, if you want something to do, is you just got to see you cannot be hostile in any way. Remember, we're not talking about physically. That's not the point. That's why I brought up about uh, don't let somebody kill you. That's not it. But up here, because if there would be, well, I'll leave it at that. The hostility, it is, I'll put it, I'll give you another little way to look at it, is talking about people. You not only got to keep, you got to keep your hands off of people's ideas. And by that, I mean not just individual ideas. It's like suddenly hearing, well, uh, such and such group or such and such religious group or such and such cultural faction in such and such places now attack these other people. And up here, being a sophisticated, well-read person, your mind immediately goes into overdrive again, just ordinary drive, but you may think, well, hey, I knew it. Here they people go again fighting over absolutes, the fascists against the communists. And you got some comment about it. It's aggression, which is a nice word. It's stupidity. Anyone who understands anything does not fool with the useless. They do not fool with anything that's out of their control. And life at the ordinary level is totally beyond a man's control. It's beyond his comprehension. It's simply that you see that it is what it is. And it's only then that you might be able to rise above it and you can get up where is everybody else is down there where you normally are. And everybody's looking off and they're going, it's a madhouse out there. I can't tell whether it's a McDonald's or whether it's a Burger King. Is it a hurricane coming over there? Which way should we go? And the guy up on the mountain hollers down, go straight. No, go barrel to the left. And you think, well, who the hell is he? 
And he's there up there and thinking, well, damn, I see it as clear as hell, which is a nice old story, but I don't take it that I'm saying, hey, that could be me sitting up there trying to direct you and say, all right, go over here. Screw all that. Is you can do it to you. Because I got nowhere to tell you to go. I can just tell you that if you stay where you are, I can tell you where you're going. <laughs> can you say nowhere? <laughs> I'll tell you what you'll see. Can you say nothing? <laughs> I'll tell you what you'll understand. Can you say nada? <laughs> All forms of staring is almost a form. Okay. A few more minutes, I'm going to stop. I don't think you people can really spend much more than an hour at a time now. But all forms of staring are a form of hostility because it is a form of judgment. And all judgment is a form of criticism. It is a form of aggression. Remember again, we're speaking strictly intellectually and there is no such existence. It's you're still tied to a body, but notice where it manifests itself because nowadays you are living a very unusual condition, which I'm sure none of you are, if you are actually having to fight every day. You're not out having to fight other animals, other humans, for your daily bread, not physically. You're not having to fight your way home. You're not having to throw people out of a cave so that you can sleep there that night. All the combat, all the competitiveness of life now is at the intellectual level. It always has been, as soon as you can think. As soon as you got to be five years, as soon as you said, Mama, Dada, then the conflict started at an intellectual level. Then the misunderstanding, then the complexity of life start at the intellectual level, as it should. But if you stay at that level, you never get any better than that. And you're not supposed to. Now, I don't know what the hell you people are doing here. You should have been satisfied. Life raised you this far, fed you, you're healthy, you're alive. You're going to live another few years and then die? What the hell? <laughs> Takes no effort. All you got to do, I mean, it really doesn't think about it. All right, let's do it. Let's all think about it a second. <laughs> That's it. Uh, I was going to also tell you two things. Then I'll keep going back. Well, I'll keep going back to it for a while. Until I get tired of it, until I realize some of you begin to take it as being some sort of dogma, and then you'll never hear about it again. But I'm sure you all have heard of pieces of it. I, I'm just sure from the whole group. But literally, to understand that life is alive, it's not some kind of rehashed anthropomorphism, it's no kind of nature worship. Life is alive, and you're just inside of it. And the other part is that at the ordinary level of consciousness I'm describing, wherein everyone exists to start with, at that level you're dealing with, and I'm going to use ordinary terms I already have, and that they fit. It's metaphor and it's not metaphor. That is apparently a 3D existence, but you are being run by two-dimensional fuel. Everybody is at that level. And it fits perfectly the allegory, the symbolic allegory of the two sides of the brain. It fits the nature that you, the man cannot think, the tongue of man cannot speak unless you've got something to push against. There is no the easy one, there is no up without down, there is no good without evil. You cannot make any criticism of anything without tacitly saying that you know better. Look at those idiots. You didn't just say that to be able to say, look at those idiots. And they may appear to be idiots. People killing their fellow man, people raising hell over nothing as far as you're concerned. But just before you went, before you went to say, look at those idiots, you're also saying, boy, I'm glad I'm not that crazy. I'm glad I'm not an idiot. And you are an idiot. <laughs> you're at the same idiocy level as they are. That's the kind of aggression I'm saying up with which you cannot put, as that great mystic Winston Churchill, I think, said. They were accusing him of, if you don't remember, ending up sentences with prepositions, and how dare a man in his position in the world, prime minister of the world, and he said that was the kind of criticism up with which he would not put. <laughs> I've always wanted to use that in a mystical context, and I just did. And I hope he's proud of us all. Even if we're going to continue this, I'll swap point around here, uh, give you some little, since I don't have any great rules and regulations, no hostility. You cannot do it. Uh, if I really saw somebody here hostile and started expressing it here, I'd tell you not to come back. There is nothing, absolutely nothing to be gained by hostility, and I am not ever going to describe to you the city of Istanbul. I'm not going to tell you what being more conscious is in any kind of discernible detail, but I will go this far, because you've already heard it, you just didn't recognize it. I'll tell you one thing. Nobody has ever been awake and had an angry bone in their head 
Definitely. at that time, in their head, which of course affects the body. Once you see it in the religious literature, the mystical literature, even the crudest, is just replete with it. Is that people look out and what little, of course it shows how much they slid to even later write about it, but be that as it may. They try their best later to talk about it and try to share it with others, as they put it. But the one thing they will say from every corner of this planet, from every epoch in the history of people who've experienced it, is the one thing they'll say, they'll look around and almost the first words out of their mouth after it's translated into at least English is, I looked around and realized everything is just right. <laughs> Which even after they get back from Istanbul, after they slide back because getting, reaching that state is not an all or nothing. You don't simply go there and stay forever. When they come out of it, which is heartbreaking in a sense, because I've given you enough bad news for once. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, after it's over, and then they try to put words on it, because of the time, you don't try to describe it. I mean, you understand also, you just, you know, there's nothing to say in that setter, but afterwards, they all describe the one thing, and it, from, from which many religions grow. But that one thing is they, afterwards they say, well, I can't really tell you what it was I saw, but I just know I've, you know, I felt so good. I felt like you know, so close to my fellow man, all that. You know, yeah. And I just looked around. I realized nothing is wrong. Nothing. But here, here they are back generally in their normal state of consciousness. You never go back completely, but trust me, back sort of where he was. And he's trying to tell his friends. And he says, I looked around. That's the one thing I can remember, that everything was just right. And I'm also aware some of you have probably had something, I wouldn't be surprised, similar with some of the psychedelic drugs because once that kind of idea got passed around, I know people have done it, and after, and besides believing that they were suddenly one of the cells in God's brain and stuff like that, but, they, <laughs> but the idea that you look around, it's very common. It was not just from the 60s, I could, I could, I could here in America, but is they will express that they looked around, that just suddenly they were conscious, and I woke up, I was, my mind was liberated, I was enlightened, I was Buddha, all this they say later, trying to describe it. And his friend said, well, what? What can you say? He said, here's the damnedest thing, because I'm back now, and it doesn't even make sense, but I'm going to tell you. You're my friend. I looked around just suddenly. I just realized everything is, you're going to laugh, is just right. And the person saying it will turn to his friends and say, I know it doesn't make sense, because it doesn't. Because like that level, you look right around, you go, well, there are people mistreating each other, people are killing people, there are people cheating people, there are people beating up on women and children. There are people slaughtering one another. Look at the injustice. How can you say that? And the guy goes, yeah, I know. I know back now I'm with you. That's why I warned you that it makes no sense except I looked, and it was. Assuming the people are not crazy, which uh, I'll tell you one more time. Uh, I will never, uh, you, you, you're going to get yourself. But I'm, I don't talk to you in any, even a small way, about something that I do not understand, something I have not experienced. I'm not talking to anybody's theory. So I'm telling you that the explanation that they use of saying everything is just right, there is no way that you can make collective sense out of it. If they are not, because as soon as you say it, any person, they don't have to be particularly aggressive towards you. They can say, well, that's not true. The world is not a just place. Oh, yes, it is. It is so just that, figuratively speaking, I'll tell you, it's frightening. But see, that's a figure of speech. What it is is delightful. It's why you always see the well, Buddha's on one. They got those kind of good statues and stuff, really. Oh, that all of them, him laying on his side, sitting down, propped up against a tree, and he's always that kind of little sh shit-eating grin on his face. Like, <laughs> because the justice of life, after a lifetime, to use him again as an example, I don't keep, I don't lay on him for any particular reasons. At least any of you still think a secret message. He just lends himself to, and I'm assuming some of you know some of the stories, not important. But anyway, a lifetime of torture and trying to follow all kinds of good religious and cultish efforts to increase his consciousness. And then he saw it. And after that, <laughs> all they left was statues and him just smiling. <laughs> But a lifetime of seeing the injustice, the horrors of life, and then to get above that level. Because within that kind of closed system, and it was a good question somebody asked me about how can man be what he is. 
little inside humor. Do you realize now with these new folks, I started the same thing? I was going to cover all these questions. <laughs> And I'm already two weeks behind, and we just started. <laughs> I thought you people would enjoy that. You cannot, if you want something specific to work on sort of in the back door before I get to this next time, is you cannot be hostile. If nothing else, you can observe you are constantly doing it. And I, for all I care, you could, be, you could believe right now that you are a particularly sensitive person, that you try and be liberal in your attitude toward other people's religious and political beliefs, and et cetera. You are constantly harping and carping. <laughs> you are constantly talking. If you're talking about someone else, you're criticizing them. That is part of the stillness of mind that the, many of the uh, mythical, mystical systems uh, attempt to talk about, is internally you shut up because it's this that's talking, and it's not you. It's not because of your childhood traumas. It's not because of the unconscious mind you have. Hell, you don't even have a conscious mind, <laughs> which is another story. That's a nice one is the more sophisticated you are is you have great faith in the explanations about how many things are caused by man's subconscious mind. You understand? It's one of these, if you want to see the, if you want to see the beauty of justice I was talking about, to believe in the power of the unconscious mind when you don't even have a conscious mind. But you understand, it's always, as long as life can go, hey, look over here, and everybody looks. All right, you like it this way? Jim Henson, he's got his hand up Kermit, and with his other hand, he goes, hey, look over here, and Kermit looks, but he made him look. Where's the freedom? Where's the wisdom? But if you're just looking, and you thought it was a Muppet show, or you think it was real life, which some people do, and vice versa, and the voice hollers, hey, look over here, and the thing has enough sense, it looks around. Except you've got to understand, it's the thing over here running one side of your brain, and it's also running this one. But once you understand that life is alive, you are, who fits your generation? Anybody remember Paul Winchell and Jerry Mahoney? <laughs> Ventriloquism fell out, but anyway, you have a man sitting there, and he has a dummy, a ventriloquist dummy on his knee. You don't understand. There's one hand running both of them, or one person, life. Therefore, no matter where you look, life's got you. Because they can say, hey, look over here. And you look, and you think, well, now I'm getting somewhere. And you think, wait a minute, I'll think about that. <laughs> and you don't realize life's got its hand up your knickers, up your dress, you're the puppet, and over here seems to be out there. Once you see that, then you understand, well, what's there to be mad about? And in fact, then you'll think, I wish I could find Buddha, and at least me and him would go, <laughs> At least now I understand why he's smiling like that. Inside of life, I know how horrible it sounds, and uh, it, I'm certainly not saying anything if you want to contribute to uh, charities, or if you saw somebody laying on the street dying or hurt, you should certainly help them, or a bird, or whatever. But the idea that life is unjust, that life is unfair, that life is coming apart, is the ordinary level of awareness. There's nothing new about it, and it's not true. And it does not take any sort of mystical view to see it. It just takes a standing up against the kind of collective flow of ordinary consciousness because you can turn right around and you can pick out local examples, which are personal anecdotes. They have nothing to do with the universality of life, but you can pick out as fast as you want to. You can just point to the newspaper, walk down the street, turn on the radio, and say, look at that. Look at what's going on right here in Bosnia. Look what's going on in India. Look what's going on in Nigeria and tell me that life is not unjust in certain ways. Tell me it's not. There's no way out, but it's not. Inside of a closed, living, healthy system, which this is, I was going to say, after all those arguments, you could turn to that same person and they momentarily, you can almost shake them out of staring if it meant anything, but just follow me. And you could say, well, you, you seem to be sophisticated and well, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the history of man. What you just think back about, uh, even the, in the West, the glory days, the golden age of Greece. All right, all right. Do you, have you read enough? You know, yeah. And look where we're staying, right here in downtown Chicago. I mean, as bad as you say it is. You understand what I'm saying? That anybody just momentarily realizes that humanity has come a nice distance. That things have changed, at least observably, in a way that an ordinary mind would have to say, yes, we have progressed much. And they can't hold it because they're turned right around and go, yeah, but how do you explain Bosnia? 
how do you explain this? How do you explain that? Well, you can't. But inside of a closed system, that which appears to be destructive is not destructive. It's always a matter of transition. It's happening inside your body. That I could jump inside your body. You can do it to yourself. Just think about it. And there are things, there are aspects of your body right now, and assuming that you're in the prime of health. There are things in your body right now that if we looked at your body as being planet Earth and all the peoples there on, I could find parts of your body that is the massacres and the slaughters going on now, right now in Chesnia or Herzegovina or Yugoslavia, the erstwhile Yugoslavia. And there's that same sorts of things going on in you, except that it's simply you at a molecular or cellular level undergoing transition. You're not destroying yourself. That's probably all you can take. Uh, since the number of people at least seem to be holding up. And I will shortly, if you people are going to continue, I'm going to find out who you are, so I will know your face and your name. <laughs>